The Beast of Tuxa, written by Trent Kanuga and Elizabeth Moon. Chapter 5. Little Moon. The rain came down in sheets and thunder rumbled and echoed in the distance. The wind shook the branches until the cabin itself swayed back and forth in the downpour, creaking and contorting as it hung suspended above the chasm. There was a single room unaffected by the curse, and that's where we slept for the night. The wooden rocking chair by the window and the old soft rug were almost cozy and inviting. I kept my head turned away from Olaf and pretended to be sleeping, tired out from the night's events. Amiku and I huddled close to Bartol, who played the role of a pillow and a heater. Olaf sat in the frame and a rounded window, staring at the intertwining network of crooked roots and limbs shaking outside. I didn't mean it, I said, breaking the silence. Was that? Olaf was brought to attention from a deep trance. You haven't said anything in a while, I turned to face him. I thought maybe you were still upset, I said sheepishly. Olaf grinned, taking a puff from his pipe and peering down at me with one eye. Think so. He's not much for holding grudges, I thought, but he still had me guessing. Nah, just thinking about some heavy stuff. Got a lot on my mind. This is my thinking face. He pulled such a ridiculous look that I had to laugh. What are you thinking about? I asked. Must be serious if you need that face. I smiled and flashed a funny look to match his, but it was met with silence. Come on, tell me, I pressed. Now I really want to know. What's going on? Olaf leaned forward and scrunched his brow. I just can't figure it out. Why? Why would my father have marked this cabin on his map? I sat up and Bartol nudged closer, poking me on my arm until his head rested on my lap, insisting on an ear rub. Again, Amiku wedged in closer, nearly burrowing under Barty. Maybe he was here before? Do you think he knew the wizard? Before the... I mean, before he turned to a pile of dust. You know. This book, Olaf pulled out the small green diary from his pocket and held it firmly to his chest. It's not just for reading. This was my father's journal of all the places he'd been from all the things that he'd seen. Folks in Tuxa? Well, he got along with them pretty good. But when I got older, mostly all they could tell me was that he was a bit odd. But they also said he was a good man. Olaf beamed with pride at the recollection. He used to tell me a lot of stories, places from far away, things I couldn't even imagine as a boy. I was Tuxin, through and through, and never even been outside of the valley. Oh, and he had a good, strong laugh. The kind of laugh that made you chuckle just listening to it. I could tell by the look on his face that he was transported back in time just remembering. You two would have been best buds. I think you're more like him. Complicated, fearless to the point of recklessness. Bold, impulsive. You leap before you look. I'm just a simple guy. I just do as I'm told, work hard. Try to earn an honest living, be useful, you know, plan ahead. That's all I ever needed to keep me happy. The point is, I didn't have his adventuring spirit. You've never talked much about him, I said. I thought maybe you just never got along with him. Olaf heaved a sigh. Ah, I was about your age when he passed away. So many of his stories, I believed, were just made up, just to entertain me. This book and the farm, they're all I have of him. Had. He whispered that last word, but I had heard it. I felt it. Brushing the cobwebs and dust off the chair in the corner of the room, he spun it around to sit closer. Why he came here to settle in Tuxa, I'll never know. It was home to me, so I never questioned it. But he wasn't afraid of no beast, I'll tell you that. He paused and looked around the room. Nor wizards, for that matter. Maybe that's why he built the farm further outside of town and bordering on the forest. Ain't no one else from the valley fearless enough to do that. The villagers all stayed close to each other. He was a real tough guy, he was. Much like yourself. He chuckled and poked at me. My dad, well, he didn't need no one. Except me, I suppose. See, I don't know much about him beyond that. Only knew my father was a father, not the man. I know he was a traveler, long before he ever came to that valley. The truth about Tuxa is that ain't nobody a traveling man in Tuxa. Mostly on account of the dark forest, I finished his thought. Not a lot I could tell you about him, even if I wanted. He started thumbing through the notebook, stopping at random pages. Belgard, Frozen Mountain, Dragon's Gate, Deserts of Hollow Wind. He even drew pictures of wildlife and detailed descriptions of how to make herbal concoctions. I never even heard of half of these things. It says here, the layered earth shells are actual echoes of the past. Here at the bottom of the world rests the nervous system of the entire planet, all converging into one central core. Each of the four ages stacked and preserved only for those shell divers with enough courage to dive deep into history and retrieve them. He snapped the book shut. 
There's so much I would want to ask him now. How did he learn all of this stuff? The truth is, Mao, I don't know much about the world at all outside of Tuxa. Never really even cared to know. Most of my years in the valley, I had everything I ever needed. My dad was so different from me. He saw and actually did things for himself, not just read about them. Then he wrote about it, all in this book. There are a few missing pages here and there, but I reckon it'll be enough to get us to Crescent Isle. Crescent Isle, I repeated aloud. That's right, our new home, where Moonkin and humans and every other race of people and creatures come together to farm and fish and just... He sighed a sorrowful, hopeful sigh. Just live in nice, simple life. Ha! That was Olaf's idea of paradise. The monastery. Well, all them monks watch over them, keep everyone safe. Not like Tuxa, I interjected. No, not like Tuxa, he repeated. I'm sorry they burned down the farm, I said sorrowfully. Eh, it weren't your fault, Mao. But I'd felt it. I knew that it was my fault. All I know is that they blamed me, but I'm not bad. Afraid to catch his eyes, I kept my head low. Never you mind, kiddo. It was because of me that they wanted to punish you. I never belonged there. Hearing that, I had to admit to myself that I secretly wanted it to happen so we could leave. Well, maybe I didn't want his farm burned down, but even still, I didn't have the courage to admit my feelings to him. Hey now, Olaf said, you listen to me. Don't you ever blame yourself for that. You hear me? Them folks? Well, they're no, but... I interrupted. But if you never picked me up from under that tree, I... Or if you never took care of me... A lump of sadness formed in my throat, and I swallowed hard against it. Finally, I said, The kids told me I was cursed. I don't want to be bad. I turned my back to him again as tears started to form in my eyes. I don't even know what a moonkin is, but I wish I'd never even heard of it. He reached over and put his hand on my shoulder. In the old words, he said softly, moonkin means child of the moon. You're descended from the heavens, brought to this world in a way that is so spectacular, so amazing that most people can't even comprehend that it's even possible. I shrugged, still feeling defeated. So what? So maybe that means you're not like everyone else for a reason. Maybe it means you're destined to do something more than any of them ever could. I can't even climb my way through a couple of mud puddles. What could I ever do? Well, don't beat yourself up over it just yet. You know, you're still working things out. He moved to sit next to me and put his arm around my shoulder. Give it time. The small creature pushed his way in between me and Barty to mimic Olaf, patting my knee. I'm already nine. When am I going to start to do something important? Don't be in such a hurry to grow up, Mao. You've got plenty of time for that. Olaf chuckled, then paused. You believe in gravity, don't you, Mao? I sat up and looked at him curiously. You asking me that while we're sitting in an upside-down cabin? I said. Well, it's right ironic that it would come up in such a place, but, you know, I've been thinking. Why do they call the monks children of the moon? Well, maybe it's because you got some kind of gravity all your own. And that gravity is going to pull at the tides of our world, shifting the balance. According to this book, that's what moon can do. They shift the balance of this world this way and that. All things in life adhere to the cycle of the moon. It's a powerful thing. Right now, you're just a little moon. But in time, you're going to grow. As you do, that gravity, Olaf reached both arms out wide, then hugged them in. It's going to latch onto a lot of things. To me, you're not just any little moon. You're my little moon. I looked at him with narrowed eyes. <laughs> Did you just make that up? <laughs> what does that even mean? I asked, secretly pleased. Olaf stood up and walked over to his own knapsack and began to roll himself into a ball next to the last remaining candle. And just as it seemed that he wasn't going to say anything, he whispered, It means I'll always be there for you. No matter what. Simple words, but they comforted me and I couldn't help but smile. The creature Amiku nudged his head into Bartol's neck and drifted off into slumber. Outside, the rain pattered against the window and thunder continued to rumble as the forest groaned. I slid back into my own bedroll beside Bartol and Amiku, and the cabin's gentle swaying put me to sleep, dry and peaceful. That was the last night of comfortable rest we would have for a very long time.